Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Laurie. I am the COO of NPM Inc. I used to be the CTO. I have been in the web industry for about 21 years now. Uh, I was a front-end dev, and then I was an API dev, and then I was a DBA, and then I was an ops person, and then I was an architect. But really what I am is a web developer. That's, that's what I care about, is making really big, fast websites. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about solving imaginary scaling problems. Uh, back in November last year, Ben Halpern uh, tweeted this fake O'Reilly book cover. Uh, he does a series of these under the Twitter name The Practical Dev. Um, but this one really got to me, and I was like, I could write that book. Uh, <laughs> So I started tweeting chapter titles for the book, uh, and I just kept going. And I eventually ended up with 35 chapters of this book, not all of which were good enough to put into a talk. Um, but that's what this talk is. This talk is the book. Uh, because solving imaginary scaling problems is an industry-wide problem, and it's not getting any better. Uh, it turns up in hacker news threads. It turns up at conferences. It turns up on the marketing pages of new technologies. It's about a little knowledge being a dangerous thing. Uh, it's about taking a good idea and applying it in completely the wrong way. Uh, so together, we're going to skim through this fake book that I wrote. Uh, and we're going to cover 22 of the biggest imaginary scaling problems. Uh, and we're going to explain what's imaginary about each problem uh, and what the real problem is and how to actually solve the real problem that you had. Uh, so at one minute per chapter, this is going to be pretty fast. Um, and I will be simplifying quite a lot. So there's going to be an enormous temptation to well actually me about various things. Like, oh, that's not always true. Oh, that's not. In particular, I am grievously conflating horizontal scaling, vertical scaling, and performance. Those things are not always the same thing. Just promise, promise me that you'll trust me that I know that and that I'm just simplifying to get through this. Uh, so now on to chapter one. Databases with cool sounding names. Uh, this is the one that started it all. You go to a conference, you hear about a new database, and the creators are very, very excited about their database. It is consistent, it is available, it is partition tolerant, it violates physics, it has no known scaling possibilities. No, that is not how databases work. Nothing can be consistent, available, and partition tolerant. That's just not how physics works. And of course there are no known scaling problems, because they just built the damn thing last week. They've only run it on 10 boxes. And everything looks perfect when you're only running it on 10 boxes. No known problems means lots and lots of unknown problems. That's what that means. Uh, so you want to try out a new database? Great. You want to build a prototype with that database? Fine. You want to use that database in production? Hell no. Don't do that. Wait until it's been around a couple of years, and you know that it's not going to like go bankrupt or get, you know, subsumed by Apple. Um, the imaginary thing here is optimism, also known as hype. Uh, so this gets the novelty badge. You hear that something exists. You decide that it solves your problem for no reason. Uh, but it doesn't. It's just new and fun. Uh, so everybody gets a badge. I made these. I drew them myself. I think you can probably tell. So chapter two, uh, minifying the JavaScript of your order n cubed to-do list. Uh, I love that the previous speaker set me up so well. This is perfect, because he was literally using the order n cubed to-do list. Um, let's break this down. Uh, order n cubed is a fancy computer science-y way of saying inefficient. Uh, if, you have, <laughs> if you have n things and your algorithm takes n seconds to finish, like you have five things and it takes five seconds to finish, then your algorithm is order n, and that's fine. If it's order n squared, then your five things will take 25 seconds to finish, and that's not so good. n cubed will take 125 seconds. It's just unbearably slow. Um, so don't do that. Um, <laughs> and here you run into minifying. Minifying is a well-known performance enhancement. You've like, our app is slow. Minifying makes things faster. If I add minifying to the slow app, that will make it faster, right? Uh, minifying takes your gigantic ass JavaScript file and it crams it down uh, so that you, it takes less time to transmit, um, which means that it gets there faster. It gets to the browser faster and it starts executing sooner so that your app seems to run faster because it's not waiting for this JavaScript to arrive. Uh, but if your app is order n cubed, that's going to make almost no difference, right? It's going to take 0.2 seconds instead of one second to start, and then it's going to take 125 seconds to run. Like, it'll make almost no difference. So this gets the missing the point badge. Uh, 
Minification works really well if transmit time is a big chunk of your performance, but if, if your application is ordering cubed, transmit time is not going to be part of your performance. So, on to chapter three. Putting a Node.js proxy in front of your COBOL backend. I tweeted about this, and like an actual like COBOL fan like started tweeting at me about how pleased he was to be like that I was addressing the performance problems in COBOL. Um, <laughs> if you've got a bunch of old, slow, janky APIs, and your team hates working with them, you can put together a nice new Node.js sort of cover on top of those APIs, and your team will love you for it because those new APIs will be nice to use, and they will write code faster because they don't have to be constantly dealing with the old APIs. They'll write code faster, but the code isn't going to run any faster, right? It's not going to help you scale because putting a server in front of another server is usually only going to slow it down. Uh, I mention this one all the time because people who are sort of selling Node to the enterprise talk about how Node is so fast, and Node is pretty fast, but not if you like, use it as a proxy in front of a slow server, right? Node's not going to speed up your COBOL. Uh, so Node.js proxies gets the so close badge because it definitely helps something, um, but it's just not the thing that you are actually trying to fix. Chapter four is fuck it, let's use BitTorrent for everything. <laughs> uh, I checked a lot of times that everybody was going to be okay with me using endless profanity through this talk, so if you missed the opportunity to vote on whether or not I say fuck every fifth word, I'm sorry. Um, you've probably heard of BitTorrent. Uh, You've probably used it to download you know, Linux distros. Um, BitTorrent is an awesome protocol that maximizes throughput. That's what it does. Uh, you've got a giant movie file, I mean Linux distro. <laughs> and tons of people want to watch the movie, I mean Linux distro. <laughs> they fire up BitTorrent, and they get that movie file, I mean Linux distro, really, really fast. Uh, Periodically, people suggest using BitTorrent to scale other things, like web servers or the NPM registry, for instance, uh, because BitTorrent does scale, right? It's distributed. It goes everywhere. Um, but it's great for moving very big files quickly, but the thing about BitTorrent is it spends the first 30 seconds like checking the entire internet for peers to work with, and that 30 seconds as overhead is sort of immovable. It always takes 30 seconds. So, it can't work for websites because you would, like, nobody's going to wait around 30 seconds for their website to start downloading. That, no, literally nobody would do that. Uh, and if every NPM package took 30 seconds to start downloading, that would be 50 times slower than the way NPM works right now. So this gets the novelty badge. It's fun, but probably not the solution to your problem. Chapter five is running the exactly the same software, but in Docker. <laughs> uh, Docker is the hottest technology right now. Everyone is containerizing their shit, making it scale. It's going to be great. Here is what containerization does. Containerization lets you quickly spin up and spin down a service because it's in a tiny little container. So if what you need to do to scale to deal with a load spike is spin up 50 extra copies of your application very, very quickly, then Docker is going to work for you. If you're doing a test suite where you need to spin up and spin down copies of your application to run the test really fast, then Docker is for you. But if you're trying to make your application faster in some way, Docker has nothing to do with that. In fact, Docker is probably going to make your application slower. Um, and if your architecture has problems, like Docker's just not related to that at all. You can't just like cram a crappy architecture into a Docker container and it magically gets better. Um, but the process of getting it to run in Docker is going to be super fun, because Docker is super fun to play with. And this is the uh, insidious imaginary scaling trap that we fall into. Um, it gets, it feels productive. So it gets the rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic badge. Uh, because you don't know what to do to make this app scale, so you just did a thing and hope that that thing helps somehow. Like, it's not related at all. Uh, which takes us to chapter six. <laughs> Splitting everything into 35 microservices is all maintained by the same person. You've probably heard about microservices. Uh, and service-oriented architecture and how they move fast and be agile. That's awesome. Um, and that is all true. Uh, but it is important to understand why microservices work, why they help. Um, microservices are a thing that helps your team scale. If you have a really big app, uh, 
and you needed everybody in that team to understand every part of that app, that was going to be really hard to do. So instead, you split your app into 35 things, and each person can understand one tiny part of the app, and you only need one person who understands how all those parts fit together. They don't need how to understand each bit works. Suddenly, everybody has a simpler job. And because everybody has a simpler job, they make mistakes less often. And because they make mistakes less often, they go faster. That's how, that's how microservices help your team move faster. Uh, so if you did that, if you split your app into 35 things and then gave all of those things to one person, you've made that person's job much harder, right? They had an app, and now they have 35 apps. It's not helping at all. Uh, so this gets another missing the point badge. Chapter 7 is 300% performance boost by deleting data, data validity checks. And this gets a new badge. This gets the 100 badge, because this fucking works. <laughs> You know how to go faster? Do less stuff. Doing less stuff is always faster than doing more stuff. Uh, and a great way to do less stuff is to be less accurate. Just throw accuracy out the window. If you've got a billion events <laughs> happening a day, and you eliminate a data validity check, and d eliminating that data validity check makes everything go twice as fast, and the result of eliminating that check is that 100 things a day go wrong, you have a billion things. You probably don't care that 100 of them are wrong. That's not going to bother anybody. Uh, where this becomes an imaginary scaling problem is when people try to do this in a situation where accuracy does matter. Right? It's easy to be fast and wrong. And if you can get away with it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, but if you need to be 100% correct, prepare to be slower. Chapter 8 is, fuck it, let's use the blockchain for everything. <laughs> You've all heard of the blockchain. Somebody mentioned the blockchain earlier today. Uh, it's that thing that they use to, to run Bitcoin and all of those other coins and initial coin offerings, which is definitely not a bubble that is going to destroy the economy. Um, <laughs> the blockchain is great stuff, and I genuinely mean that. Um, it is a distributed database that nobody controls that lets you prove that things are true in a very hard to fake way. That's useful if you're running a currency. Not so much with Bitcoin, because it has trouble at, at very high transaction rates. But what the blockchain is really good at is lower transaction stuff, uh, where provability is still a very key feature, like X signed this contract, or Y created this photo. You know for sure that they created this photo, because they put the photo into the blockchain, and that proves forever that they were the first person to have that photo. That's a great use of the blockchain. Uh, but if you want a distributed database, if you want a general purpose distributed database, the blockchain is not the thing that you want. Uh, and there are way more efficient options. So that gets the novelty badge. Chapter 9 is using protobufs to pull 300 times per second. Got one laugh from a Googler. So <laughs> say you have an HTTP API with, with a JSON payload, uh, and it's too slow. There's this thing called protocol buffers, or protobufs. Uh, it is a super efficient binary protocol. Um, and, is, and it is awesome. It makes things really, really efficient on the network, and that makes stuff faster. But hang on. Why are you polling 300 times per second? Almost nothing changes 300 times per second. And if something did change that often, it would be way more efficient to use an event streaming API than it would be to use a polling model. This is how imaginary problems start. You start with a bad architectural decision, and you try to scale by getting better at that dumb idea. Whereas if you just change to some other more efficient solution, some, better, some more suitable solution for this problem, you'd get a lot more efficient without having to go to enormous technical lengths. The imaginary problem here was that you had a hard problem. Uh, you didn't, and very few people do. Uh, most stuff that you build in your career has already been built, and that's great. Uh, so you should solve the actual hard problems in your application and reuse simple solutions whenever you can. Chapter 10 is put a cache on it. Caching is an excellent way to scale. It is also a great performance boost. Caching works a lot of the time, so cache the fuck out of everything. It's fantastic, but it doesn't work all the time. If your app is super slow, caching is going to make the second hit faster, but that first hit is still going to be painfully slow, and probably no one's going to like using your app. The other way this manifests is people slapping their entire app behind a CDN. Um, CDNs are an excellent way to scale, uh, but only if what you're serving can be cached, which is a thing that a surprising number of users of CDNs sort of ignore. Uh, 
if it's a content site, if you're the New York Times, then a CDN is going to do really great wonders for your performance. But if you're a messaging app, every message is individual. Every message is unique. You can't cache them. Putting your app behind a CDN isn't going to help at all. It's probably just putting a proxy in place that's making it slower, in fact. Uh, so the imaginary part here is thinking that because caching is a great solution a lot of the time, it's a great solution all of the time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> chapter 11, rewriting your APIs in C when your payload is three megabytes of JSON. So you've built a service, uh, and it's starting to get busy, and things are beginning to slow down. Um, you've got a scaling problem that is also a performance problem. Uh, first off, can you just buy more boxes? Because buying boxes, buying more hardware, is nearly always going to be cheaper than hiring a developer or spending a developer's working time making your app faster. Boxes are really cheap, and developers are really expensive. Uh, but say that you've tried that, and you've got 50 boxes running, and stuff is still super slow. You've got to rewrite the API so that it's faster. That's an OK thought. But the next thing you go to is, and so I'll rewrite the API in a faster language. No, because lots of things make APIs slow, and one of them is network transit time. So if your API response is three megabytes of JSON, it's just going to take a certain amount of time to send that much JSON around. right? It's going to take a certain amount of time to parse that much JSON. It's just a lot of JSON. Um, so you can just change what the API does. Make the API response smaller. Make it more efficient. And you don't have to rewrite the whole damn thing. The imaginary part here was that you were thinking that your API response was fixed, but you control the API, so you can make your app faster again without having to go to enormous like, architectural lengths. Chapter 12 is, fuck it, let's rewrite it and go. <laughs> Often follows chapter 11. Um, so you've been rewriting your app for a while, and it's slow. Uh, the code is a massive technical debt, so you hate it, and it's slow. Um, you decide to rewrite in a faster language. Um, here's the thing about Go. Go is nice. Uh, it is compiled, and it's fast. Um, it is much faster than JavaScript. Uh, if absolute raw performance is your problem, um, then Go is great. You get a team together. You build a prototype. You put, take your three most popular API calls. You rewrite them in Go, and it is fast. Everything is perfect. You can declare victory, except here's the imaginary part. You had technical debt. The performance problem wasn't caused by the language. It was caused by the technical debt. If you rewrote this thing in any language, it would go faster. If you rewrote this thing in the same language, it would go faster, because the technical debt was the problem. Uh, and now you have some new problems, because now your app is written in two languages. So you either have to maintain them both and duplicate logic between these two code bases, which is a gigantic pain, or you have to rewrite the other 20 API calls in the old app into the new app, and that is going to take a long ass time. Uh, so rewrites are very seldom as productive as a judicious refactor. Uh, but they're way more fun. And again, that's why we fall into this trap. That's why you let your imagination run away with you. So uh, this was perfect because you just asked a question about it like 10 minutes ago. Optimizing your pings while hosting 300 megabyte video ads. If you've ever built an ad-supported site, you know this pain. You're a diligent web developer. You care about web, about web performance. So you minimize your JavaScript. You use the smallest framework you can find. You render server-side to optimize time to first render. You like gzip the hell out of everything. It's all behind a CDN. And then at the very last second, you slap in a JavaScript tag, which creates an iframe, which creates an iframe, which creates 15 more iframes, which loads a 300 megabyte video ad. And suddenly, your user experience has gone completely to hell. Because ads are often terrible, and the person who can fix this isn't you. The person who can fix this is your sales department, which is exactly what Lon was just saying. Uh, and you can justify this with numbers. That link is to a study which shows that if your page takes four seconds to load, and you can get it down to two seconds, it will, twice as many people will see that page. So if you're having a conversation with your sales department where you're like, OK, well, this terrible ad will be seen by half as many people than this slightly less, like, this slightly cheaper ad will be seen by twice as many people. You can say, we'll make more money with the cheaper, faster ad, and your sales department will agree with you. Your sales department is not the enemy. Chapter 14 is blaming everything on the last person to quit. <laughs> and this obviously gets the 100, because this works perfectly. 
Uh, the performance is shit. It was definitely that last person's fault. It is going to take us three weeks to clean up all of the shit that that person did. Um, the best part is that they won't even get mad because they did that to the person who quit before them, right? <laughs> like, just, just roll with it. Use the disruption of a team member exiting to pay down the technical debt in your organization. Just shh, don't tell anybody. This is like a secret in the industry. Everybody knows that we do this. Everybody's cool with it. Just <laughs> stay cool. Chapter 15 is fuck it, let's try Erlang. So if Go wasn't cool enough for you, the next step up from rewriting in Go is rewriting in Erlang. Uh, let me give you a list of all of the production websites written in Erlang. I'm done. <laughs> That's not to say that there's nothing important running in production that was written in Erlang. Uh, WhatsApp is written in Erlang. Um, Facebook Messenger used to be written in Erlang. I discovered it wasn't anymore while I was fact-checking this talk. Um, and of course, NPM uses CouchDB, and CouchDB is written in Erlang. Um, and obviously, we make perfect technical decisions. Um, <laughs> Erlang is the coolest of the functional programming languages. People are very, very fond of functional programming. It has all sorts of neat properties. Um, but scaling is not one of them. The superior scaling ability of functional programming is imaginary. I'm not saying that functional programming doesn't scale. I'm just saying that it doesn't necessarily scale better than any other way of programming. It's just another way of programming. A crappy architecture that's written in a functional way and a crappy architecture that's written in any other way is still a crappy architecture. Uh, so there's no evidence that it scales any better, and the lack of like, major production apps written in Erlang suggests that possibly your efforts are better spent doing some other thing. <laughs> Chapter 16, sharding your database before adding any indexes. Like four database developers laughed. Uh, sharding is an impressive sounding technique, or possibly a funny sounding technique, depending how immature you are. <laughs> Um, it means taking a single large database and splitting it into lots of smaller databases in a, in a systematic way. So if it's a database of people, say, you could take everybody whose name starts with A and put them in the first database, everybody whose name starts with B and put them in the second database. Now you have 26 databases, each 1 26th of the size of the full database, and smaller databases are just faster. So now your, uh, your application is faster uh, at some cost of, of complexity to your application, because now your app needs to know which database to go to. Um, Sharding is a technique that works. It is effective. People use it all the time. Uh, the problem is that people know it exists, and they jump towards sharding. Um, they sh jump to it before they do basic stuff, like just writing better queries or adding indexes to their database. There's some enormous percentage of databases running on Heroku that have no indexes at all. Uh, and while we're talking about databases, let's go to chapter 17 which is replacing an SQL database with a NoSQL database and then re-implementing SQL in your ORM. <laughs> which is a very long and extremely specific chapter title because it happens all the damn time. Um, a thing people do when they can't get their database to go faster is they throw it away and switch to some other database and hope that the new database is faster. Uh, and the hope there is the problem, right? Um, it happens no matter which database you started with. Everybody always, you know, at some point says, this new database will fix all of our problems. We will switch to this database. Um, databases that go faster often do it by doing less. They, they took my advice from chapter seven. and They just, like, threw away the validity checks, or they only let you look up by primary key, or they don't let you do range queries. Um, and this becomes a problem when people switch databases too soon. Uh, they find out that they need some feature that a general purpose database has that this new database that they've switched to lacks. Uh, and then they have to rebuild that feature. And because they're rebuilding it you know, in a half-assed, begrudging way, it's slow and it's buggy and it makes your app worse than it would have been. Um, the imaginary part here was that performance gains can come for free, that scalability can come for free. There are always costs here. Uh, so you can go faster by throwing away stuff you don't need, and you absolutely should. Uh, but if you do it too soon, you'll find that you threw out something you still needed. Chapter 18 is a typed checked transpilation step will surely speed things up. And now the Microsofties are giving me dead eye because I'm going to be like, oh no, I'm going to rag on TypeScript. <laughs> Types are wonderful and magical, and no one will ever hear me say anything different. Type checking is a thing that people love to insist is important with a capital I. 
It is a thing that serious programmers have decided that we should all be caring about now. Um, people have written lots of very big, very complicated, very successful software and languages that have no type checking at all, but I'm not here to say that types are not useful. Type checking tends to pay off when your code base is very, very big and is being worked on by a lot of people simultaneously uh, because it finds whole classes of errors that are otherwise quite difficult to spot. Type checking is basically a, basically a type of testing, and like all testing, it helps your team go faster because they spend less time fucking up. Um, so types will help your team scale um, and your code base scale. Uh, and as people were pointing out earlier today, like if you've got type checking along with uh, you know, compilation steps, it can actually get you some performance on the front end. Um, but it's not going to help your app scale, right? Like an a really crappy architecture with types is still a really crappy architecture no matter what you do. Um, and it is a shame when people are trying to evangelize type checking sort of overreach and claim it helps your app scale. It doesn't automatically help your app scale. It's not, you know, fairy dust that you can sprinkle onto everything and make it better. Chapter 19 is, fuck it, let's use a bloom filter. Uh, bloom filters are an amazing technology. Uh, you give an identifier to a bloom filter and it will tell you one of two things. The first is, I have maybe seen this thing before, or I have definitely never seen this thing before. That is a very specific and useful function, and it does it in an extremely memory efficient way, even if you have millions or billions of things. So like, if you're trying to count how many unique users you have on a website, you could, contain, you know, you could have a list of a billion people and make sure that you know, every time you see a new one that you haven't seen them before, or you throw those users at a bloom filter, and the bloom filter will tell you how many unique users approximately you have in a much more like, time and space efficient way. Um, but the thing about bloom filters is that I've been writing code for 21 years, and I've never used a bloom filter. In fact, I've never even seen anyone use a bloom filter. I know that they exist, and I know that people use them, uh, but very few people operate at the kind of scale where a bloom filter is going to be at all useful to you. So the imaginary part here is if you think that you need a bloom filter, you're probably imagining it. Chapter 20 is renting a 32 core machine with 500 gigabytes of RAM on your limit is disk I.O. Earlier, I mentioned that you can scale by buying more hardware, and you should absolutely scale by buying more hardware if that is a thing that you can possibly get away with because it's so much cheaper. But you can't just buy any hardware, right? You can't just automatically scale up to the next size on Amazon and hope that's going to fix everything because hardware has lots of axes on which it varies. Um, and you have to know what the bottleneck is. You have to know what it is that you're fixing. So if you size up to the next you know, box size on Amazon, you're probably going to fix your scaling problem if your problem is processor or memory but not if it's disk I.O., and disk I.O. is very often the problem. Uh, if you're on Amazon, you're using EBS, and it's not I.O. optimized, that's almost certainly your problem. Um, so your hardware requirements can't be imaginary. You can't just sort of like, you know, pay more and hope, much as that is convenient and easy to do. Chapter 21, we are nearly at the end, thank you all. Um, writing a new language almost the same as your old language, but faster. <laughs> Once upon a time, uh, a kid called Mark Zuckerberg uh, wrote, built a PHP app, and it accidentally became the single largest web application in the entire world. There are now 17,000 people working at Facebook, and they do a lot of stuff, and they write a lot of code, but fundamentally, they're all trying to make this one web app faster. Uh, and because they're at such enormous scale, it lets them do some really wacky stuff. They wrote a thing called HHVM, which is a compiler for PHP that takes it down to like machine code. Uh, and on top of that, they wrote Hack, which is a language that looks like PHP but has types, because they sprinkled the type dust on it. Um, <laughs> Hack is much faster than PHP. Uh, as scaling solutions go, this has to get the 100 badge, because it absolutely works, right? Like, if you can afford to rewrite the whole damn language so that it's faster, you should absolutely do that. <laughs> Uh, that's what V8 is, right? V8 is Google looking at the web going, man, if we could just make JavaScript a lot faster, we could sell a lot more ads. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, so uh, the type checking in Hack isn't what's helping them go faster. The fact that it's a lot faster is what's helping them go faster. It's helping them scale. Uh, this isn't imaginary. This is just completely awesome. <laughs> Chapter 22 is, fuck it, let's use machine learning for everything. Um, Machine learning is without question the newest and hottest. It's even hotter than Docker. Um, it is sometimes misleadingly marketed as AI, 
Uh, and let me tell you, if somebody had invented AI, it would not be running a fucking startup. It would have taken over the world. That is what AI will do. You will know that AI has been invented because you will have robot overlords the next day. Uh, what we do increasingly have is a shit ton of machine learning going on. Stuff like Siri and Cortana and whatever Google's thing is called, those are machine learning. Uh, machine learning can do amazing things. Uh, like generate a nightmare cat from a cat-shaped doodle. Uh, but fundamentally, machine learning is quite simple, right? What this thing is doing, it's taking a huge number of examples and it's training a model that can take the input and guess what the output is going to be. So if you give it enough cats, it can guess what a cat is going to look like. And if you give it enough spam, it can guess what the spam is going to be. Uh, and the other magical thing that machine learning can do is get your startup funded. Uh, it doesn't matter if your startup is like Airbnb for sock puppets. Just throw some machine learning into that pitch deck, and you will get at least a million dollars. It is just the magic dust. Uh, the machine learning is real. The funding is very real. Uh, but the benefits are often imaginary. If there's one problem that ties all of this stuff together, that problem is guessing. Uh, the problem with imaginary scaling problems uh, isn't that the solutions are bad uh, or that the problems aren't real. It's that you're just guessing what the problem is. The way to scale every application is carefully. Look carefully at what's currently happening. Get some metrics, measure the hell out of everything, find out where the real problems are, and think of the simplest possible solution. Uh, avoid huge rewrites and big technology changes because those things are risky and expensive and time consuming. Don't use new things just because they're new. Uh, use them if they solve your problem and nothing has solved your problem before, but only then. Um, using these principles, CJ and her team have scaled NPM from 1 million downloads a day when we started the company to 455 million downloads just yesterday. Uh, and we never did a big rewrite. Uh, there's, some, there's still some really stupid, really old tech in there. And we are not proud of every single thing that is a part of our architecture, but we are very proud of what the architecture as a whole accomplishes. Uh, so I hope some of this advice has been useful to you, or at least funny to you. And thank you all very much. That was delightful. <laughs> I took so many notes, but they're all like satirical. They're not like actual questions. Are you just back channeling me well, on paper? Well, yeah, yeah, basically. Because um, I was like thinking, like I'm not a, I'm not a word scientist, but <laughs> lines of code increasing is definitely scaling. Like, <laughs> I think you're wrong there. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I'm glad that you brought up machine learning, because that's sort of like, I thought the next big thing would be like quantum computing, but I guess that's like too scary for people. Mm -hmm. And some people still think Moore's law is a real idea still. <laughs> um, have you ever considered like how NPM can incorporate machine learning into its stack? I mean, I make fun of it, but NPM is literally incorporating machine learning right now, um, because uh, we have like 8 million users now, um, which is, it's sort of a new inflection point we've hit where like the number of the percentage of those people who are just like incorrigible griefers who will just mess up everything uh, is large enough that like it's becoming a constant battle. So um, it's not done yet, but we are applying machine learning to detect when a sign up is a spammer and when a new package is spam. That's really cool. Um, another thing uh, uh, I, I had written down, I guess this is also like a weird situation thing. I wrote down <laughs> the note. Uh, does using BitTorrent make me a distributed systems engineer? Absolutely. Yeah, because another another fake idea I feel like is distributed systems engineering and like how like everything's distributed. You have like your browser and then like the app is like not there. It's like somewhere else. Um, this is a lot of really useful knowledge, and I think all the feedback from Twitter is like you have to write this book. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, and I always respond like, don't tell me what to do. Like, <laughs> you don't have to write this, but this is like really excellent knowledge. Um, but besides from being in the slideshow, a lot of this stuff is very trial and error for people and becomes folk knowledge. Um, are there other companies that you learn these from besides your own? Huh, that's a good question. And like, do you see other companies now, like, you have to like name any companies, but like, 
do you see mistakes being made or <laughs> good things being done that um, are driving your decisions at NPM? It's like, I've, I've sort of discovered that like one of my roles is, as like somebody who's been in the industry for 21 years is just sort of like the keeper of the folk knowledge. Just be like, we tried this in 1997 and it didn't work. Um, sometimes it works, right? Like, you know, what was that? There's like the modern equivalent of pets.com just sold for $100 million. So just because we tried it before and it didn't work, it doesn't mean it doesn't work now. Pets are still big in America. <laughs> but people will shop for them online now, it turns out. Um, the, the, problem with, um, the, the, the problem with the distribution of knowledge of this kind within the industry is that it's very, very arbitrary. It's very, very accidental. Like, I've learned from other companies, but only because I hired people from those companies who then told me about how they did it. Um, like, you only ever hear about this kind of stuff from other companies that you don't work at, like in the event of a disaster, right? Like you see, you know, a company, you know, that had eight forms of backup that, and none of them worked, and so they lost all of their data, and you go, whew, yes, good thing I know that backups are important. But like that was the day that a bunch of people learned that backups are important, right? Like that was the day that folk knowledge got distributed to a bunch of people. Um, so. I like giving these sorts of talks. I like giving these like, hey, this stuff has always been true and it's still true kind of talks for that reason. Yeah, I wonder if there's any way to sort of make like DevOps systems administration stuff less like disaster driven. <laughs> like, because that's what it is. Like ultimately, like I, I learn from like destroying things as opposed <laughs> to like reading it in a book or something like that. Um, so maybe you should write that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, who, hands, hands, show of hands, who thinks I should write this book? Whoa. Everyone, okay. raise their hand. All right, uh, you all need to write letters of intent promising to buy the book. <laughs> That's a, a, a Kickstarter, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Just kickstart the damn book. That's Talk right. to Wilman. Excellent. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.